And now we move on to Lexington, where our second feature, Rick Beyer, comes from today. And sometimes in Lexington, you might see Rick in different clothing and colonial uniform giving tours for the Buckman Tavern. He grew up in Providence, Rhode Island, and as a child, he loved to read, play with model trains and shortwave radio equipment. He's worked as a radio reporter, TV news producer, and a janitor, and he was a creative director for Smash Advertising, where he worked on making history minutes for the History Channel. And this work led to writing books and documentary work for him. He is the author of a number of books with the title The Greatest Stories Never Told, published by HarperCollins. His most recent, I believe, is The Greatest Music Stories Never Told. He's also published his own short stories in uh, autobiographical nonfiction collections. And he's made films for the History Channel, National Geographic, the Smithsonian, and others. He's appeared on the Discovery Channel, Fox News, CNN, NPR, and uh, contributed a film to an acclaimed collection of 200 History Minutes hosted by Sam Waterston. Presently, he's working on an independent film entitled The Ghost Army about an extraordinary World War II deception unit that used trickery against the Germans on the battlefields of Europe. Last January, he gave the keynote address for the Medtronic Neuromodulation Division Innovation Week. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> well, um, yeah, and if uh, you go to his website, you'll learn lots of interesting things about Rick Beyer uh, and a few other uh, interesting special notes, uh, such as camping for 10 days in mosquito-infested Siberian wilderness is one thing that he has done in his life. He has interviewed Jimmy Carter in the White House. He's climbed Mount Washington five times. He was consoled by Mary Tyler Moore. <laughs> he married a beautiful woman in a lightning storm. What the Army Times said about Rick was, just when you thought you knew everything about everything, along comes Rick Beyer to prove you wrong. So it is now time for Rick Beyer to come and share some of his stories of history and perhaps other things with us. Please help me give a warm morning welcome to Rick Beyer. Can you just start right in? It took the country by storm, dividing America into two opposing camps, those caught up in its passion and those determined to stamp it out. What was it? The tango. Born in the slums of Buenos Aires, the dramatic dance swept across Europe and America in 1913. Go where you will, it is impossible to escape it, opined a Nebraska newspaper. Tango tees and tango classes became all the rage. In New Orleans, the French Quarter became known as the Tango Belt because of all the new dance halls. In Atlantic City, the trolley company introduced a tango car for those determined to dance their way to and from work. <laughs> Not everyone was thrilled. Cleveland and Baltimore banned the dance. Boston stationed policemen at dance halls to take down tangoers. <laughs> Harvard University prohibited any member of the track team from doing the tango, <laughs> declaring that the dance does not tend to make outdoor athletes. Evangelist Bob Jones said New Yorkers were tangoing themselves to the brink of hell and added that the only difference between Manhattan and hell is that Manhattan is surrounded by water. Conflict was inevitable. Pittsburgh teachers went on strike when forbidden to tango. Dancers at a church social in Connecticut rioted when told the tango was a no-no. A soloist at an Atlantic City church choir was told to choose between the tango and the choir. She left the choir. 
America's tango fever eventually subsided, but it proved to be a preview of things to come. Culture wars over jazz, rock and roll, hip hop, and other music and dance crazes feared as threats to our way of life. Still, somehow, we keep going. Now that's one of the stories from the new book that, uh, that Cheryl mentioned, The Greatest Music Stories Never Told, 100 Tales from History to Astonish, Bewilder, and Stupefy, available at a table in the back of the room. Uh, I thank you all for coming today, and I thank Cheryl for that introduction, which is still has my head swimming a little bit. Uh, I think this is the third or fourth time I've been here, and I did, uh, I did uh, read a story once before, and my wife, Marilyn Ray Beyer, who many of you know, has also uh, been here as well. That's the beautiful woman I married in the lightning storm, in case there was any question whether there was another one. Um, it seems very appropriate in this venue to come and read uh, uh, prose about music, since this is a venue de uh, devoted to, to prose, poetry, and music. Uh, and so I have a few more stories from the music book. I'm particularly fascinated as a historian by uh, turning points in history, the small moments upon which great events pivot. And a lot of my stories are about moments like that. And that illust they illustrate what I consider to be the most important history lesson I ever learned, which I will be happy to share with you. Everything that ever happened almost didn't. So history is made by living, breathing people acting crazy spontaneously in the heat of the moment and you never know what's going to happen. And the next story is about one moment just like that. It's called But for a Button. On a Friday evening in Hamburg, December 5th, 1704, a boisterous crowd gathered around two angry young men dueling with swords in the marketplace. One was a composer and music critic of some renown named Johann Matheson. The other was a hot-headed 19-year-old who played second violin and occasionally harpsichord for the local opera company. His name was George Frederick Handel. The two friends had become increasingly irritated with each other. The breaking point seems utterly ridiculous in retrospect, a silly argument over who should be sitting at the harpsichord in the finale of Matheson's opera, Cleopatra. That led to a fist fight in front of the audience, and that in turn led to a duel. Egged on by the crowd, Matheson saw his opening and lunged at Handel with his rapier. But instead of delivering a mortal blow, the blade caught on a large metal button and snapped in two. No harm came of the encounter, said Matheson, and we were soon reconciled again. A fortunate outcome for music lovers. Handel went on to become a fabulously, a fabulously successful composer in England. But by 1741, he was depressed and bankrupt, his music no longer in vogue. The king of Prussia wrote to a friend, Handel's great days are over. His inspiration is exhausted. The 56-year-old composer was suffering from rheumatism and the effects of a recent stroke. It was at this point that he wrote what would become his best-known work, Messiah, in just three short weeks, finishing it appropriately enough on a Sunday. Every Christmas, the Hallelujah Chorus from Handel's Messiah is performed by all manner of choirs across the globe. Millions have thrilled to its thunderously triumphant strains. But for a button, it never would have come to pass. Uh, Bonnie was talking about late bloomers, so I guess Handel was a late bloomer in the sense that his greatest work was composed at that very ancient age of 56, uh, an age I'm very familiar with right at the moment. Um, so he's an inspiration to those of us who are aging artists everywhere. I'm always on the lookout for inspiration. I imagine that many of you are as well. Uh, where does it come from? What leads the songwriter to create that haunting lyric or unforgettable melody? Well, the next uh, story, the inspiration came from anger. Songwriters John Kander and Fred Ebb sat down at the piano to bang out the songs that they had in mind for director Martin Scorsese's new movie. Scorsese and actress Liza Minnelli, the film's leading lady, liked the songs just fine. But over on the couch, Storm clouds were gathering on the face of actor Robert De Niro. He thought the title song that the writers had composed for the movie was pretty weak, and he wasn't shy about saying so. He had a question. Could they try again? 
Kander and Ebb had written the hit musical Cabaret just a few years before, and they took great umbrage at this request. We walked out of there, Kander recalled, highly insulted that some actor was going to tell us how to write a song. Nevertheless, they agreed to make a brand new start of it. Still smoldering, they dashed off a new song in about an hour. Their anger lent the song an air of defiance. Said Kander, our attitude was, we'll show that actor. Actually, he showed them the way to the biggest hit of their career. The movie, New York, New York, was a big budget flop, forgotten today by all but a few hardcore film buffs. But the title song, born out of annoyance with Robert De Niro, would, be gone, would go on to become a monster hit for Frank Sinatra, a staple of karaoke bars, and the unofficial anthem of the Big Apple. And if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Now, one of the great music storytellers of our time is a familiar name to many of you, Casey Kasem. I, I always go for the lowbrow. Low lowbrow is where I'm aiming at. Who for many years hosted uh, America's Top 40, coast to coast. I used to love listening to the tales he told, and I tried to capture a little of the Casey Kasem magic in the next story. And at the end, uh, please help me when it comes time to recite or sing a few bars from the song in question, because I am not a singer. And so um, I don't want to be stranded up here alone. And I think you'll know it, so I'm, I'm pretty confident about that. When Jerry Felder heard a record by the great blues artist Big Joe Turner, he decided that he too wanted to be a blues singer. The fact that he was a white Jewish kid from New York wasn't going to stand in his way of getting into what was almost exclusively an African-American genre. At age 16, he started performing in blues clubs under the name Doc Pamas. Doc started songwriting to make money between gigs, and the songwriting eventually proved more lucrative than the blues singing. He teamed up with composer Mort Schumann, and their partnership resulted in such hit songs as Teenager in Love, this Magic Moment, and Viva Las Vegas. But there was one song that was more personal, more searing, than all the rest. He wrote the lyrics late one night on the back of an old wedding invitation, recalling the day three years earlier that he had married Broadway actress Willie Burke. It was a joyful occasion, but there was one moment tinged with the taste of the bittersweet, it was the moment after the band struck up a tune when the bride and groom traditionally have the first dance. You see, as a child, Doc Pomus had been crippled by polio. He could walk only with great difficulty. As a blues singer, he had to hang on his crutches while performing. Dancing was out of the question. At his wedding, he urged Willie to dance with the other guests. He could only watch with mixed emotions as she twirled across the floor without him. It was with that memory in mind that Doc scrawled a set of lyrics revealing his most vulnerable inner self, the heartfelt plea of a man who couldn't dance to the beloved bride just out of his reach. And I think you know the words. It's don't forget who's taken you home and in whose arms you're gonna be. So darling, save the last dance for me. Again, once you know the story, boy, the song just is never going to sound the same again. I'm going to end the singing part of the uh, night here for myself. <laughs> uh, I'm going to leave music behind right now um, and uh, end with a longer piece about a different kind of history, personal history. Now, Fifteen or twenty years ago, I sat down in writing an oft-retold family incident from my boyhood, and I submitted it to several magazines who showed a distinct lack of interest in publishing it. Go figure. I'm sure that's never happened to anybody here. So I put it aside. And then about a decade ago, my wife, Marilyn Ray Beyer, called me at work and she said, NPR is doing this thing, this national story project, where writer Paul Oster is collecting nonfiction stories to read on the air. You should send them that story. And I do what my wife tells me. <laughs> You've met her, right? You've, you know. <laughs> so I stuck it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, and dropped it in a mailbox. And that's all I did. And that set off quite a chain of events. 
Paul Oster decided to read that story on NPR and then he included it in an anthology that came out called I Thought My Father Was God. The story has since been translated into several languages, performed on stage in France, reprinted in a number of other anthology books, including most recently an English textbook in Japan. The funny thing is I, I haven't done anything to make any of that happen aside from putting it in the envelope that day. Uh, 10 years ago. Woodlet life could be just as easy for everything else. Now a big part of the success of the story was due to a single edit that Paul Oster made. A single edit. The text ran about four pages long and he just lopped off the first two pages. Just like a razor blade. In media res, as they say. Start your story in the middle. Well he did that for me. All of the colorful intro material I wrote was gone. And I have to admit, it made for a far better story. So there's a lesson here we all need to keep in mind that we can use a good editor. So this is my last story this morning, and it is called A Plate of Peas. My grandfather died when I was a small boy, and my grandmother started staying with us for about six months every year. She lived in a room that doubled as my father's office, which we invariably referred to as the back room. She carried with her a powerful aroma. I don't know what kind of perfume she used, but it was the double barrel, 90 proof, knock down, render the victim unconscious, moose killing variety. <laughs> she kept it in a huge atomizer and applied it frequently and liberally. It was almost impossible to go into her room and remain breathing for any length of time. When she would leave the house to go spend six months with my Aunt Lillian, my mother and sisters would throw open all the windows, strip the bed, take out the curtains and the rugs. Then they would spend several days washing and airing things out, trying frantically to make the pungent odor go away. This then was my grandmother at the time of the pea incident. It took place at the Biltmore Hotel, which to my eight-year-old mind was just about the fanciest place to eat in all of Providence. My grandmother, my mother and I were having lunch after a morning spent shopping. I grandly ordered a Salisbury steak, confident in the knowledge that beneath that fancy name was a good old-fashioned hamburger with gravy. When brought to the table, it was accompanied by a plate of peas. I do not like peas now. I did not like peas then. I have always hated peas. It is a complete mystery to me why anyone would voluntarily eat peas. I did not eat them at home. I did not eat them in restaurants, and I certainly was not about to eat them now. Eat your peas, my grandmother said. Mother said my mom in her warning voice. He doesn't like peas, leave him alone. My grandmother did not reply, but she got that certain glint to her eye and grim set to her jaw that signaled she was not to be thwarted. She leaned in my direction, caught my eye, and uttered the fateful words that changed my life. I'll pay you five dollars if you eat those peas. <laughs> I had absolutely no idea of the impending doom that was headed my way like a giant wrecking ball. I only knew that five dollars was an enormous, nearly unimaginable amount of money, and as awful as peas were, only one plate of them stood between me and the possession of that five dollars. I began to force the wretched things down my throat. <laughs> My mother was livid. My grandmother had that self-satisfied look of someone who has thrown down an unbeatable trump card. I can do what I want, Ellen, and you can't stop me. My mother glared at her mother. She glared at me. No one can glare like my mother, okay? If there were a glaring Olympics, she would undoubtedly win the gold medal. I, of course, kept shoving the peas down my throat. The glares made me nervous, and every single pea made me want to throw up, but the magical image of that five dollars floated before me, and I gagged down the very last of them. 
My grandmother handed me the five dollars with a flourish. My mother continued to glare in silence, and the episode ended. Or so I thought. <laughs> My grandmother left for Aunt Lillian's a few weeks later. That night, at dinner, my mother served two of my all-time favorite foods, meatloaf and mashed potatoes. Along with them came a big, steaming bowl of peas. She offered me some peas, and I, in the last moments of my innocent youth, <laughs> declined. My mother fixed me with a cold eye as she heaped a huge pile of peas on my plate. Then came the words that were to haunt me for years. You ate them for money, she said. You can eat them for love. <laughs> oh, despair. Oh, devastation. Now, too late, came the dawning realization that I had unwittingly damned myself in a hell from which there was no escape. <laughs> you ate them for money. You can eat them for love. What possible argument could I muster against that? There was none. Did I eat the peas? You bet I did. I ate them that day, and every day they were served thereafter. The five dollars was quickly spent. My grandmother herself passed away a few years later. But the legacy of the peas lived on as it lives on to this day. If I so much as curl my lip when they are served, because after all, I still hate the hard little things, my mother repeats the dreaded words one more time. You ate them for money. You can eat them for love. <laughs> Now, you know, I should just say thank you and, 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 and walk out, hopefully to huge ringing applause. But I do just want to mention, my mother passed away a few years ago. Uh, uh, I, I was very proud when this was published in the anthology, and I gave her a copy of it. She knew that I'd written the story, and of course the story had been told many times at the dinner table. And then she looked at this and she said, oh great, so that's how I'll be remembered after I die. <laughs> Revenge of the writer, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. This song's about a, uh, a soup kitchen in Fall River. Across from Hawaii, corner of Maine and Pine. You know the poor blame the rich and the rich blame the poor and the hustlers deal behind the back room door. Cap in the front got his hand in the tail and the mules emptied the mill. The men with the guns shoot the men with the sticks and the stone drove the weep in the hands of the poor. The hungry fell to their knees to pray. God let come what will. When there's nobody there I got a watch I got time God's got a church And they feed my kind Jesus is on the radio Superman's fat and crying Santa Claus stole the show But I see God In these friends of mine There's a man with a spoon 
in his hand and potatoes and corn and gravy on a plate as big as two. Is a woman with a smile and her eyes are clear and she walks over to me she says what can I do for you? Jesus is on the radio Superman's fighting crime Santa Claus stole the show But I got God friends of mine You see the poor blame the rich and the rich blame the poor and the hustlers deal behind the back room door The cop in the front get his hand in the till The mules empty the mill And the men with the guns shoot the men with the sticks and the stones roll the weight from the hands of the poor The hungry fell to their knees to pray God let come what will to go but I see God in these friends of mine hey maybe we'll see you in Boston occupying Boston are you uh, one of the 99% that's me